our world and beyond. Space, in partnership with the European Space Agency. In life, everything comes to an end. It's true for humanity as it is for spacecraft. At ESOC, the operations center of the European Space Agency in Darmstadt, Germany, the final moments of a satellite pioneer, the European Remote Sensing Satellite, ERS-2, are being monitored and controlled. Its operational life ended on the 3rd of July, 2011. Deorbit operations then began. We are now actually approaching the final phase. The first two phases were just uh, dedicated to lower the orbit step by step. We have reached our target altitude of about 570 kilometers. The last point is uh, now to getting rid of all energy resources on board, energy resources, and also all pressurized systems. The timing is critical. In order to avoid any risk of explosion, all the fuel, hydrazine, which is extremely combustible, must be used up. And that's only to be done at the last point of the um, the orbiting activity, which is emptying the tanks. Then we have to quickly to react, to switch off the batteries, switch off the transmitters, and that's basically the end of the mission. ERS will remain in this low orbit, causing no danger to other spacecraft. Within 15 years, it will eventually disintegrate in the atmosphere. The ERS story began in July 1991, more than 20 years ago, with the launch of the rocket Ariane 4, which carried ERS-1. Then, in April 1995, ERS-2 was launched. The two satellites, 12 meters long, were practically twins, although the baby brother had more observation instruments on board, and for the first time on a civilian observation satellite, radar. That allowed it to observe day and night, and also through the clouds. A primary mission was to study the oceans and ice fields, sending back data. The Nansen Center in Bergen, Norway, was closely involved in this work, studying and verifying the quality of the data sent back by the ERS. We, we were responsible for a lot of the ice uh, not necessarily calibration, but validation. So we, we went up there with uh, icebreakers and uh, one icebreaker and, uh, and a normal ship and some airplanes. And we had people on the ice making uh, drilling in the ice, looking at the surface structure, and then see what you get from the satellite. And from that one, you, we can make mathematical formulas and uh, then derive from space what type of ice we have. In polar orbit, at an altitude of 780 kilometers, the two satellites went around the Earth in 100 minutes. They worked in tandem until the disabling of ERS-1 in March 2000. Its twin continued alone to fulfill its mission. At ESRIN, the center of Earth observation missions of ESA in Foscati, Italy, all the data from ERS has been stored for nearly 20 years. This started a new era, and uh, the originally the concept of ERS was to have a satellite for ocean and maybe ice observation. But it turned out that it became the standard instrument for all geosciences. Uh, so we attracted thousands of scientists and scientific projects with this satellite. Satellites are essential for the overall study of our planet. As they return periodically to the same place, they can, over time, provide mathematical formula for temperatures, winds, and the composition of the atmosphere. ERS-2 was particularly efficient in calculations for sea levels. It was the first time that we could measure worldwide the sea level rise uh, with this satellite. So we got valuable information now over 20 years time series to see that the sea level, uh, the rate of sea level rise has increased uh, from maybe 1.6 to 3 millimeters per year. You see, uh, these satellites uh, have started a lot of activities in Europe and a lot of successor missions. 
with a mix of various instruments and board combining the altimeter, temperature, imagery and land cover, great advances were made mapping inaccessible areas. Take the example of Mount Cameroon. Before ERS-2's observations, the mapping was very rough. With each pass of the satellite, one piece of information was added until the area was mapped precisely. In 1980, the accuracy of the cartography was around one square kilometer. After ERS-2, it was increased a thousand times. Mount Etna, which is well known, is another example of the versatility of the observations from ERS. Using data collected over a decade, it was able to produce a graph to show the movement in the cone of the volcano. To get such results, there are a whole range of instruments on board. The ERS-2 satellite has four instruments. Uh, one is the GOME. The GOME measures the atmosphere, uh, the uh, chemistry in the atmosphere, like ozone, NO2. The radar altimeter is measuring precisely on centimeter level the surface of the, of the oceans. Uh, then you see off to the ATSR, which measures the inf with the infrared instrument precisely on 0.1 degree the temperature of the oceans. And the most characteristic part is this antenna up here. There you have the radar antenna, which makes images also when it's uh, dark and through the clouds. And you have this horns here, which is really unique. And this is the scuttrometer showing, measuring the, the wind speeds over the oceans. With these instruments, it is possible to see, to study, and to quantify the flow of the glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic. As they melt, flow into the sea, it helps with the study of the ocean. The Nansen Centre is named after the famous explorer and Norwegian diplomat who, in 1895, set out to use the natural drift of the ice cap to reach the North Pole. The expedition was only a partial success, but his name lives on. This area is given over to the study of the dynamics and physics of ice, ocean and winds. With ERS-1 and ERS-2, we have in total had nearly 20 years of observations. And it has been the possibility to see the changes from one observation to the next continuously over this duration that has really allowed us to completely understand the observations, convert the data into meaningful geophysical uh, understanding. And without these two satellites, we would not have been today in a situation where we are with numerical weather prediction and ocean forecasting. To be able to observe in all weathers is an asset in the Arctic where global warming is opening up new shipping routes. That is when the radar instruments come into their own. Altimetry is maybe the most simple of these instruments. It looks straight down and it measures the height of the satellite above the ocean surface. And with that uh, observation, we can reconstruct three important uh, parameters. Surface currents, surface wind, and surface waves. The images provided by the altimeter data are used to develop interactive maps. We see several interesting features, many related to ocean currents that we see here, meandering, contrast patterns, but also we see clearly patterns of wind here close to the coast. For example, here we see the winds coming out on the fjords and we see yet stronger winds and, and less strong winds. And from this image we can quantitatively calculate the wind as seen here in this column map. The arrows show the wind direction coming out here and the wind speed is up to 50 meters here in the red yellow areas and down to 5 meters in the blue. So there are quite strong wind gradients here over short distances. We can also compare this with the model wind that we see here. This is from the NSEP model. We see at a much coarser resolution and we don't see the fine details as we see on, on the SAR image. So, so this is one of the reasons why SAR is a unique resource for this kind of high resolution wind mapping. Since 2002, an eight-ton satellite has taken over. 
It is called ENVISAT and has 10 integrated observation instruments, some of which are derived from ERS. Soon, next generation satellites will be in orbit. These are the sentinels of a joint program between ESA and GMES, the European Union for Global Monitoring for Environment and Security. Well, GMES will be uh, in the first generation uh, constellation of seven satellites uh, with which we look into very different parameters of the Earth, starting uh, with the sea, with ice, atmosphere, land cover change, land use change, uh, so many of the important environmentally important parameters uh, will uh, be available then in a constant flow of data. The new satellites will be equipped with more modern and efficient instruments. But it is important not to forget the work of ERS-1 and ERS-2, which have given us a better understanding of global warming and the continued melting of the North Pole ice cap. Their legacy is huge. Now the work really starts. So we have a satellite, we have 20 years, we managed to have a successful mission from the beginning to the end. We didn't lose a satellite, we always main control, but there are 20 years of data in the archive. So these data must be processed, reprocessed again, we must ensure continuity with the futures. This is a heritage of, for mankind in the future, this high precise measurement, and we have to maintain, preserve these data, and we also have to adapt the mission now, the exploitation of the modern technologies. It is the 5th of September at the operations center of ESOC in Darmstadt. The atmosphere is one of sadness. ERS-2 engines have burned their last hydrazine. All systems have been disabled. Our satellite has completed its long program of three and a half billion kilometers around the Earth. In the next 15 years, it will turn into heat and light.